So uh, let's get started. It's 8 o'clock Central Time. Welcome to the webinar on uh, Well Care 101. I'm Steve Wilson. I work at the State Water Survey in, in Illinois at the University of Illinois. And with me tonight uh, is Katie Hollenbeck from the Water Resources Center and Dan Webb, also from the Water Survey, who runs our public service lab as a chemist. And I want to mention that uh, this program is funded through US EPA and through a grant to the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. And they've been a great partner for us, and together we've developed you know, all the resources you'll find on our website. So, yeah, just to get started here, hopefully, there we go. This is part of a national program. The private well class has now been active for, um, this is the fourth year. The highlight of this is a 10-lesson course that you can sign up for at privatewellclass.org. This webinar is being recorded, as are all our webinars. And so if you want to see those, they should be available on YouTube and on our videos page on our website. And I'll show a few of those tonight. Some of the questions were about things that we actually have made short videos about, and so we'll go from there, and I'll show you where those things are. As I mentioned, today we're going to talk about the basics of well care and how to ensure your water is safe to drink. And then um, we have had a bunch of questions from all of you that have registered for the webinar, and we're going to go through as many of those as we can. Some just came in today, those we probably won't get to but uh, many of the others we hope to. Here's uh, Chuck Curtis isn't with us tonight, but Dan and Chuck are both chemists here at the Water Survey, and those are the guys that can answer the water quality-related questions. I'm a groundwater hydrologist and, and know more about the source water end and aquifers and well types and that sort of thing. So, And Katie's with us from the Water Resources Center. She's part of our, boy, marketing communications group. She helps out with our newsletter and our podcast and a lot of our multimedia efforts and uh, keeps us all straight, basically. And as we go through this today, if a question comes up on the GoToWebinar panel, there's a place to ask questions. Katie's going to monitor that, and at the end, we'll try to get to some of those questions as well. So if you have a question that comes up while we're doing the webinar tonight, just go ahead and post it in that question box on GoToWebinar. So things to remember about wells, and we say this about every time, Private wells aren't regulated. That's As a well owner, you're responsible. The best way to look at it is that you're the purveyor of a very small drinking water system. Just like a small rural town that has a water operator, you're the water operator for your family of four or six or two or whatever it might be. And so it's up to you to make sure your system's maintained and that your water's safe to drink. And that's actually a bigger responsibility than most people realize. Groundwater though in many places is very safe, and it tastes great, it's mineralized so that you know it really uh, is good for you. There are places where there's naturally occurring contaminants or man-made contaminants that have made their way into an aquifer that might be hazardous to your health and that's why it's important to understand um, all those issues. And so as we said here, it can be colorless, odorless, and have no taste. A lot of times you look at well water that may have uh, it might be colored slightly, may look like it has a lot of turbidity, it may be perfectly safe to drink, whereas a water that looks totally clean and clear may have something in it. So you can't go by that, you need to sample your well. And I now, I grew up on a, uh, an old dug well, my grandpa, hand dug in 1933, but now I live in Champaign, Illinois, so I pay 40 to $50 a month for my water from Illinois American Water Supply. And that's the cost spread out over the 150,000 residents that use that water. And it's not the water you're paying for. It's the sampling, the maintenance, and the infrastructure to keep uh, make sure the water's safe. And that's what your responsibility is as well. So for well considerations, quickly just some you know, high-level information. Usually well depth, uh, deeper is generally better. It means you're protected from the surface. And many times well contamination comes from the surface or from a breach in a well where something from the surface can get in. The other things to consider is the location on the landscape. A lot of times we see wells that are maybe in a floodplain, and uh, the well owner doesn't understand why they may have E. coli or coliform contamination every spring, even though you know the, the creek or the river around their well is flooded. Or we found wells that are in the middle of a feedlot. And I'm not talking about a pasture for cattle. I'm talking about a muddy feedlot where the cattle are aggregated close proximity. Groundwater flow direction, that's not something you always know, but if you have a shallow well, you can consider the flow direction probably being the same as the land flow direction, uh, the shallow water table. 
but it really matters, especially if you're in an area where there may be neighbors that have septic systems or other things, livestock. Understanding the direction of water flow in the ground uh, may help you understand if you do have a contamination problem or what risk you might have. And just in general, the area around your well, is it protected? Is it an upland area? Are you storing things that might be considered a contaminant near the well? All those sorts of issues. So those are just some basic considerations to think about. And really a lot of times what ends up happening is, so construction code has changed over the last 30 years or so. Many years ago there were no codes in any state for well construction. A lot of people put their own well in. Like I said, I grew up on a well my grandfather hand dug in 1933. It's uncemented brick. It's only 14 feet deep, and it's in a ravine. On one hillside, there's a cornfield. The ravine itself is in the middle of a cattle pasture, and so not the best place to have a water supply. And so when construction codes were developed in many states, and as they have changed over time, older wells are not required to meet the new code. So you see, especially in rural areas, a lot of older wells that have been grandfathered in, they may still be in a pit, which, you know, the invention of the pitless adapter for colder areas, um, a pit was usually installed so that the well wouldn't ever freeze and the pipes wouldn't freeze, so you had your well capped four feet or so below land surface. Today there's a pitless adapter that you can use, so you should have your well brought up to the surface and not have a pit. Those are very dangerous. They provide a place for water to pond, and they're also ris risky as a, a safety hazard. So things like that are old hand dug wells. Many are still in use, and one of the that's probably one of the biggest factors for uh, anyone using those type of wells typically have uh, a lot more issues with surface contamination. Here's some examples. Uh, the one on the upper left is from the Washington Department of Ecology. They're the agency in Washington State that regulates drillers and well construction, and they have a blog. They put out information all the time. There's been a lot of really scary pictures come out of there uh, that they found. In this case, uh, you can see there's a, a large diameter corrugated well casing there. The jet pump is uh, there, the blue jet pump near the surface, and there used to be a piece of plywood that went all the way across the well. Uh, the person who fell there and died probably walked across that a thousand times and eventually it broke and gave way and ended up killing her. The one on the upper right is from southern Illinois. This is an old brick hand dug well that's uh, actually stones, and then they've put a, a concrete casing for the upper four feet. A goat made its way into that well, and no one noticed for quite a while. And, uh, yeah, not a pretty picture. And the one on the bottom, the head of the groundwater section here, Walt Kelly, my boss, we had a project in the late 90s where we sampled a lot of dug and bored wells in Illinois. This is one of the wells we sampled. It's on a slope. It's in a cattle pasture that's a cornfield right above it, upslope. You can see the house up over the hill. It's about an 11-foot diameter well, and the way it's covered is with 2x10s and 2x8s with tin on top of that and then some concrete blocks to hold everything down. Certainly not protective of small insects, snakes, things like that that might get in the well, frogs just not a, a very safe water supply. And these are the ones that typically have continual coliform bacteria problems, or in this case, you can see the mud around on the right side there where the cattle are probably rubbing against that post, and, you know, they're causing a lot of certainly health issues as well. So what should you do with these wells? You need to bring them up to code. You can talk to your state agency that regulates well drilling and find out what the code is, talk to a contractor. Uh, the best thing to do is to make sure your well is protected near the surface. Again, that's generally where a lot of the problems occur. You know, it's not, um, they worry about things getting in wells and pharmaceuticals and some of these high-end chemicals and all that stuff, but for a lot of private wells, it's really basic information that isn't being provided to well owners so they understand their risks, you know, too close to a septic system, too close to a feedlot, not having a, a well that's properly sealed at the surface. Those are very basic things that everyone needs to understand, and they're the cause for the majority of, of problems with water quality in private wells. So the best thing to do is to make your well safe uh, to start with. Well logs weren't required until the 1960s in some states, not until even the 2000s. So 
there are many more wells in most places where it's not documented. So there's no well log on file. There's no way to understand if you don't already know or don't know your driller to understand how deep your well is, what kind of well you have, what the construction is, all those sorts of things. And so there are a lot of abandoned wells that are undocumented, like the well I showed you with the goat in it. Um, that well isn't being used anymore. It's on a farmstead in southern Illinois, and that well should be filled in. Um, it should have been a long time ago. So like pits uh, and well pits, these are a safety hazard, as you can see from that. And um, it's also a risk for you and liability. If you have an abandoned well on your property and anyone falls in it or gets hurt, um, it's going to be your responsibility. And it could contaminate an aquifer in some cases. And if that were to happen, you may affect many of your neighbor's wells. People see a pipe in the ground, sometimes they think that's the best place to dump things. And that's a risk. Okay. So, so here's some other examples. The two pictures both are, again, from the... Washington Department of Ecology in their blog, you know, there's a, a horse, it fell in a well, they had to get out, and then there's firefighters here, a Sheldon Washington man who fell 45 feet into a well and was lucky enough to survive. So, you know, the, the four newspaper clippings over here, three of those are all from Illinois in the mid-90s, and the third one down is uh, Jessica McClure, everybody remembers that, that's old enough, when she was trapped in a well in Texas for 18 hours. It was carried live on CNN. The rest of these all happened in Illinois, and, and what ends up happening is the Springfield paper and the Galesburg paper and uh, one of the Chicago papers each had an article about these people falling in a well, and you don't hear about it on a larger scale. And so just because it's not national headlines, um, it happens a lot more than people realize, and that's the concern with abandoned wells. So one of the best practices you can do is uh, if you have an old well on your property and you're not using it, or if you are, is to make sure that it's uh, properly covered and safe at the top so that things like this can't happen. So some other things, we're going to go through a few BMPs or best management practices. One is just unless you have the capability, you really should use a licensed well driller, pump installer, or contractor when working on your well. Um, I know there's a lot of folks out there who are able to take care of their wells, but if you're unsure, it's a big investment. It's like your car. You don't not change the oil or change the valves or whatever in your engine on your own. You have a, a, a specialist do it, and a lot of times it's necessary uh, to do so, even though it's more expensive. So that's one thing. Just if you're sure and you know what you're doing, uh, it's your responsibility and it's your right, but if you're not sure, uh, the best thing to do is to use someone who knows what they're doing and is licensed and bonded and all those things. Understand the rules in your state. Not every state has the same rules, especially if you're going to put in a well. I talked to a gentleman today who um, they're putting in a new well. Uh, the best thing he can do is make sure that he understands the rules in his state, What a, uh, that he's using a, a licensed driller, that you know they're putting a well and it's properly constructed, they provide all the information you need when you're trying to drill the well so that you feel comfortable. I ask a lot of questions. Are they a member of the National Groundwater Association? Are they a master well driller? Um, how much experience do they have? All those things so that you know that, um, and ask them for references. Talk to neighbors who might have used them uh, to drill a well. Make sure that you're getting someone that, uh, you know, six months from now, if you have an issue or you have a question, uh, they're going to take care of you and not just uh, say thanks and be gone. So as far as the well site, there's a lot of best practices, and I'll show something here at the end, but as far as the well itself, it should be elevated so that if there's any ponding of water, you know, it's going to run away from the well. If it's got a vent, the vent should have a screen to keep uh, small critters out, that the casing, if it's PVC especially, is sound and not no cracks, those sorts of things. Uh, the annulus should be properly sealed and the ground sloped up around the well so that water flows away. And, you know, one of the best practices is, is you should just inspect your well every year. The example I use, I, was a, I grew up on a farm. I was pretty crazy with our riding mower. If our well would have been out in the middle of our yard, I guarantee I would have hit it at least once or twice, just not paying attention. And it's easy to do, especially with a PVC well. Um, a riding mower hits that, it's going to crack it. And so um, that crack is your source of contamination that lets things through. You just need to be sure that your well's uh, sound, and that's why you should inspect it every year. This is from the Minnesota Department of Health, but most states have something similar to this. It's their setback requirements, 
when you drill a new well. You know, for instance, in Illinois, the setback for a septic system is 50 feet from the well. Some states it's more, some states it might be less. And the reason I use this one, it's in our class as well, the 10 lessons that we provide, is because it shows you all the things that could be a risk to your well, things you might not consider. You know, if you've got a vertical heat exchanger, you know, that's using groundwater. And it could, if it's close enough to your well, it could have an impact, especially those that were, um, in some states, some of the laws weren't as strict on those heat exchangers when uh, they first came into being. And they're using uh, types of antifreeze that might not be safe in the environment. And so if, if it's not properly designed and they leak, uh, you could be causing a problem. So um, there's two parts to this. Here's the bottom half. But again, I show this just to say there's a lot of things you should be aware of. And some, um, you know, even like electric lines or close to a building, we find all the time, I went to measure someone's well who had a problem. We got to their house, and I asked them where their well was, and they're like, well, we, it's under the garage. They basically cut it off below land surface, and they wanted to put their garage there, so they put a concrete pad over it. And obviously, there's no repairing the pump. There's no getting in the well. There's no anything. Uh, once they have a problem with their well, they'll just have to put in a new one or tear down their garage. So common sense certainly comes into play uh, with some of these things. And, um, you know, again, this is just to give you an example of all the different things you should be concerned with, especially it becomes more important if your well's shallow or if it's a dug or bored well that is getting water from the shallow water table. That is much more of a risk because it's more surface water that's infiltrating in the ground that might be getting in your well. Um, as far as septic systems go, if you're not familiar with where your septic system is or where your tank is or where your septic field is, you really should be. It's a wastewater treatment system and you really need to manage it just like you do your well. This is an example. Um, it's from the National Environmental Services Center at West Virginia University. But this is a two tank system or two compartment septic tank. And you know the waste comes from your home. Uh, whether it's from your sink or your toilet or wherever, and uh, it settles. Eventually the solids build up in that tank, but the idea is the solids are supposed to build up in the tank so that the water that runs through with all the bacteria that's breaking down all the material that runs out into your septic field or your soil absorption field, as they call it here, doesn't clog things up, and there's a gravel area where it allows things to infiltrate and there's a lot of bacteria in the soil then that can break things further down. There are certain things about a system like this that's in balance. Um, we get a lot of, of questions about adding yeast or other kinds of additives. If you manage your system the proper way, you don't need any of those things. It will work itself out. It's meant to last for a long time, and it will work properly as long as you take care of it. So as far as a to-do list for septic systems, you need to maintain the area around your tank and drain field don't drive over with heavy machinery. Make sure that the inspection port and the manhole are always available. You know, no trees, concrete, or asphalt. Try to reduce the amount of water going in your septic system. That doesn't mean you have to conserve water necessarily, but you shouldn't have your sump or a whirlpool or your softener backwashing into your septic system. That's a lot of extra water. You know, the bacteria that are in the tank can get uh, weakened or washed away, so to speak. If there's a, a higher instance of flow, it gives the bacteria less time to break down the material in there, and it's just better to, you know, not have those things adding to you to the load, if you will. And as far as other important things, you know, people pour things down their toilets all the time, clean out their paintbrushes. If you think about it, or even old pills. Well, if you're if it's an antibiotic and you put it down the the toilet, it ends up in your septic system. What's an antibiotic do? It kills bacteria. And so um, that can affect your septic tank. And one of the biggest things that people don't realize is garbage disposals are really bad if you have a septic system. And that's because those, especially like raw fruits and vegetables and peels and all those sorts of things, there are a large amount of solids. And because they're still in their raw form, they don't, uh, bacteria can't break them down as well. And most uh, experts say that if you have a garbage disposal on your system, and your tank is sized to, say, have it pumped every four years, you should cut that in half. And so that means you should be pumping your tank every two years because those solids get in there and then they get buried and the bacteria can't work on them and your tank fills up a lot sooner than you think. So 
you can measure the solids in your tank or a contractor can for you and you should inspect your tank regularly to make sure it's not too full. What can happen eventually is those solids can get into your drain field and plug all those holes in your perforated pipe and uh, you'll, be in, you'll end up putting in a new system because it'll clog it up and it won't work anymore. And the worst way to find that out is if it backs up into your home or if you realize that you've got this really green wet patch in your backyard near your tank where everything's starting to come to the surface. And so um, pumping on a regular schedule, making sure your septic system is working properly is important. Also the location. Um, I'm going to get to a question at the end here about livestock near a well. And my concern is that uh, it could be that the well is close to the septic system. If your well is too close to your septic system or there was no consideration of your drain field when the well went in, you're opening your well up to potentially E. coli and bacteria contamination. So it's important to keep those things separate and away from each other. And there are a lot of laws meant to protect for that. But again, some old systems may not, um, may not have considered that. As far as testing, um, we recommend you test your well annually or any time the well has been opened. Uh, you're opening, when you open the top of a well, you're creating an avenue for something to get in. And anything you notice, you know, if taste, odor, color, somebody keeps getting sick, there's a lot of ways where things can change in your well or, you know, even it's rare, but even an earthquake can affect a well in some cases. So even a minor earthquake, uh, we see even water level changes in wells in Illinois where we really have no earthquakes, but there's tremors that are measurable. And so anything that might be different about your well, the best thing to do is just to go test it. Um, so what do you test for? It really depends on your situation, how deep your well is, where your water's coming from. You know, if there's areas where you're near a river, it's all sandy soil from the surface on down, basically the aquifer's at the surface, or you're in an area where there's known contaminants. Like we have certain aquifers in Illinois that are known to have arsenic, and there's other areas where there might be radon or radium or, you know, some other contaminant that's naturally occurring. So the best thing to do is um, we'll provide you with a core set of what we recommend, but you should always ask your county or state health department for advice. What do they recommend you test for? And again, nitrate and coliform annually um, because they really indicate a pathway to your well. They're pretty ubiquitous in environment, especially in shallow and at the surface. And so if you continually find coliform or nitrate, uh, higher nitrate in your well, it's likely that there's some breach near the surface that in your well that's allowing that in. So as an example, too, you should also do a little investigation. This is the Massachusetts DEP's website. So they've got this, uh, they've looked at arsenic and uranium in the state. There's a lot of it in some places. So they've created this website for private well owners. Type in your address. It'll tell you if you're at risk for one or both of those contaminants and give you guidance on what you should do. And I just show this, and I'll show another one here. Just as an example, some states have all their wells mapped and available online. Some have all the water quality for hundreds or thousands of wells online. You can see areas in some states where there's high arsenic, where there might be pesticides that are higher in some places, where there's been a lot of farming that's you know in shallow aquifers, all those sorts of things. So do a little investigation, understand which agencies in your state or area have this type of information, and it'll, you know, you know, information is king, right? It really is. Understanding and education and calling these folks, they all want to help. They really do. Most of them, if you call them, will want to find out where about you're at, and if they have information, just like the well owners in Illinois call me, and I can look up our well logs, where we house all the well logs for the state, uh, Dan has water quality analysis for over 30,000 wells that have been sampled in Illinois. So we have a decent idea of what the water quality is in most of the aquifers here. And well owners call us all the time, and that's our job. And there's those folks in, in most, if not all, states. Another example here, this is Rhode Island. And I always love to show this because um, the little circles that are everywhere are where there used to be orchards, where they used a lot of arsenic. And so they basically put... Uh, you know, a two to five mile band around a lot of these orchards and, and are telling people if you're near one of those, you should sample for arsenic. The big splotch in the middle is beryllium. And, um, and when I found this a few years ago, I didn't realize beryllium was a regulated contaminant by EPA for community water supplies, but it is. 
and it has health effects. And Rhode Island just happens to have uh, the type of geology and geologic materials where there's a lot of beryllium naturally occurring in that area. And so if you live in that area and those counties where there might be high beryllium, you should sample for beryllium. Not something we normally recommend. Um, so here's what we recommend. And, you know, the idea behind this is you should sample your well annually for nitrate and bacteria. It indicates a pathway into your well. So if something's happened that's changed with your well, it'll show up. And initially, if you've never sampled your well, we recommend the suite of materials so you understand if there might be naturally occurring arsenic or if they're, you know, if your water might be a little salty and there's chloride, TDS, and all those things. And the idea here is like arsenic, for instance. I've done a lot of arsenic research, and what we find in our aquifers is that if you have a well that has 30 ppb of arsenic today, if you sample it in five years, it's going to be between 25 and 35. And five years later, it's still going to be between 25 and 35. It doesn't seem to change a lot. And that's the same with a lot of these. The hardness isn't going to change a lot. The chloride isn't going to change a lot. But if five years later you sample your well and one of these things has changed significantly, then you need to start investigating why. If all of a sudden you're starting to see a lot of copper or, you know, especially copper or lead, then it, it could be a piping issue. You know, there's a lot of information these days out about Flint, Michigan and what happened there. But the truth is, any home before 1984, I think, lead was an acceptable pipe material. And so, especially really old homes, you likely have lead pipes. And depending on how corrosive your water is, you know, what happened in Flint, the lead pipes there had scale buildup on the inside of them. So you weren't getting any lead in, coming out of the pipes into the water until they switched their water source and they stopped using corrosion inhibitors. And then that ate away that scale and then the corrosive water started leaching lead. And so understanding how corrosive your water is and those sorts of things, if you have lead pipes, you should definitely do a suite of all of these things. Um, and Dan could probably fill us in a little bit on that at the end here if there's questions. Because corrosive water will leach lead from either solder or, you know, and, and it also causes problems with copper and those sorts of things. So anyway, enough about that. But yeah, I guess the last bullet's the most important one. Talk to your local or your state health department. Those are health professionals. They deal with a lot of well owners in their counties or areas. And so if there are issues like Tazewell County in Illinois, there's some arsenic, you call the Tazewell County Health Department and they're going to tell you, yeah, you probably need to take sample for arsenic because we find a lot of it in our county. Whereas in some other areas of the state, even in some states in entirety, they just don't have arsenic issues. So it really just depends. It's naturally occurring, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, so where to get it analyzed? Ironically, our lab is not certified anymore because of the EPA's rules. They've made it uh, cost prohibitive for us, and it's, it's happened at many universities across the country. We have a very good lab. We follow all the EPA protocols. We use the results. You know, when I do a, a research project, Dan's lab does all our work for us, and we're confident in the results. But it, we're not accredited anymore with the state of Illinois. And what we tell people across the country, just to be sure, is you probably should use a state accredited lab. And there's lists available, and those are the labs that are accredited to do community water supply samples for a community. And, um, that way you, there's some assurance that it meets quality standards and they've met testing requirements and those sorts of things. But uh, again, here in Illinois, our public service lab, until 2006, well owners in Illinois could get their well sampled for metals and inorganics for free. And now that program is still very reasonable in price, but it, uh, there is a cost just because of our state budget. And uh, it's a service to the folks in Illinois that have private wells and it's, uh, you know, we've been around for nearly 100 years. So. As far as a lab, when you talk to a lab, they should give you good information on how they want you to sample, when, how quick you need to bring the sample in, how to store it and preserve it, and they should give you all that information. If you are talking to a lab and they're like, you need to tell us, and they don't want to give you information, find a different lab, because it should be a customer service driven type of thing, and you want to a lab that you're comfortable with, and you know you're going to get, uh, when you get your results, you might get some information to help you understand those results as well. And again, the lab should provide bottles and everything else you need uh, to do the sampling. So as far as interpreting results, 
there are websites out there where you can type in the results and a lot of documents that explain what it means if you have this high level or this low level of a certain contaminant. I think it's fine to use those, and I'm going to show you one in a minute that uh, the state of New Hampshire just put together. But in the end, you should always take your sample to a county health or public health department. Private wells aren't regulated uh, in any state. And so your sample, even though if you go to a health department and say, you know, here's my sample, what does this mean? They may recommend you don't drink the water because it's high in some contaminant, but they can't tell you you can't drink the water. So a lot of people don't understand that. They feel like they can't take their sample to the health department because it means they may tell them they can't use their well anymore, and that's just not the case. So they're there to help you and help you understand the health risks, and they are health professionals. One thing we recommend is if you do find something in your well, it's always good to resample, especially a bacteria hit. You might have accidentally sneezed, or there's so many things that can happen. You know, water supply operators for community water supplies sometimes have to resample just because they're concerned they may have done something wrong when they're sampling, and they have to do it every month. So it's easy to make that mistake or to contaminate a lid or whatever. Before you get too alarmed, the thing to do is to take a second sample. So if you do have E. coli, you should boil your water or bacteria. You should boil your water until you can chlorinate your well, disinfect it, and make sure it's safe to drink. So here's a New Hampshire website I mentioned. It's called the Be Well Informed Guide. This is for New Hampshire residents, but it's very appropriate for most of the country as far as at least seeing what the regulations are because there are no real regulations for what's a limit for a private well. So, for instance, for a community water supply, they can't have arsenic over 10 ppb. So that's used as a guide for private wells to say if you have over 10, that's not considered safe by EPA, but there's no rule that says if it is over 10, you have to do anything about it. There's a lot of folks in Illinois in this area I mentioned earlier where there's fairly high arsenic, you know, especially in the very rural areas. Some of those farmers there said, I've drank this for 90 years and I'm fine. And even though their arsenic might be 50 or 75 ppb, they don't see it as a risk and they continue to drink it. So it's up to you. But this is one site that has been vetted by the state of New Hampshire, which is you know, a reputable source, if you will. It's a very well done site. And so there's a place here at the bottom where you can click on it and test, put your water results in. So I threw in 15 micrograms per liter, which is PPB. And uh, the nice thing about this, one of the things we teach people in our class is understanding units. You know, one part per million is 1,000 PPB. And if you have your units wrong, you might get a real big alarm, or you may think you have no problem when you really do. And so understanding units is something that we actually have in our class lessons and what each one means. And uh, in our pretest for the class, there's an online pretest you can take. I think 27% of all the maybe three or 4,000 people that are taking our pretest miss the answer to this question, where we ask one, uh, or 0.1 milligrams per liter is how many PPB. So most people get it wrong. And so it's important to understand units, which, again, this is why this is such a nice site. They help you. You can use whatever units the lab gives you the data in. You don't have to convert anything. So um, I just threw in 15 ppb of arsenic, which is over the standard. So what it says is the value exceeded drinking water limit of 10. And so then they've got here's some recommendations on types of treatment that you might be able to use. This actually asked if you have any other analysis to add, because depending on some of the other constituents, the recommendation on, on how to deal with this contaminant might be different. And so, I don't know if that's in here or not, I'm going to move on. But you can see there's, you can type in a whole bunch of different types of analysis uh, if you've had that done, and it'll give you ideas on what you might need to do, or, you know, again, in the end, use this as a guide, and then go to your public health department and ask them, exactly what your results mean. Uh, so yeah, here I say that. This is just a guide. Always take your results to, to a qualified health department or health professional. They want to help you. That's their job. And so they want to make sure that you're being safe and that you understand the risks. So um, they can't tell you to stop drinking your water, which I mentioned already, and they can only make recommendations. So um, it's always worth getting that information. Um, as far as treatment goes, we have a whole lesson on treatment and issues related to treatment if you need to add treatment. 
my point with this slide is that if you have any kind of treatment, a softener, a filter, RO, you know, reverse osmosis, they have a maintenance or replacement schedule, and you really need to be sure you're strict about following that. They're there for a reason. You know, an RO cartridge can harbor bacteria. So if you're not changing it or if you have a filter that eventually is full and you don't change the filter, water can just bypass it. So whatever you're trying to filter out may not be being filtered anymore. So if you're going to have treatment or if you do, it's important to follow the maintenance schedule. When we first started our class online, which again, that's a free class that we have. It's 10 lessons. I had a health professional from uh, another state contact me and basically asked me not to say anything about treatment because in his experience, more treatment systems end up not being maintained the way they're supposed to and end up causing more problems than those that are actually being used properly and actually do what they're supposed to do. And that was just his opinion and how valid that is. Um, I don't have enough experience with treatment to know working with private well owners, but it, it certainly sold the point to me uh, that we really need to make sure people realize how important that is. So that's what I have for my part of this. And we got a lot of questions from people and I'm going to start going through those. We aren't able to answer them all. There's some that we need to look up and talk to other professionals to get answers. Some of you just signed up in the last day, and so um, I didn't pull those questions today. I pulled from uh, before that, and uh, there were actually a lot of questions. We could be here for a number of hours if we wanted to go through them all. We are developing a web page, kind of an FAQ, if you will, for all the questions that we received from all of our webinars, anybody who's emailed us or any of the phone calls we've gotten, it's hundreds of questions. And so we've about got the structure of the website done. We just have to populate it now with all the questions and answers, and that's going to take some time. And um, we hope to have that up in a few months. But a lot of these basic questions or a lot of questions that have been asked already will be there. It'll be a resource for people, and hopefully it gets a lot of use. Dan and I are both on the call. Katie's here to take your questions tonight. Uh, Chuck has also uh, helped answer some of the questions here, but he's not here to defend himself, if you will. And we will look at questions at the end that you give us tonight if we have time. So, and Dan, feel free to pipe in. And these are questions, again, that you all submitted. So how do I find out what aquifer my well is using? Well, there's two things that really go with that. One, you need to know how deep your well is and, what, and whether you're well screened. And so the well type, whether it's a bedrock well or a sand and gravel well, how deep it is. And if you have the log, that's great. And if it has a screen, then the water's coming in from a sand and gravel aquifer at the screen interval. So a 100-foot well with a screen from 95 to 100, the water's coming from 95 to 100. If it's a bedrock well where it's cased down to 60 feet or 100 feet, but the well's 300 feet deep, the entire area below where the casing stops is open hole, if you will, and you're getting water from that entire unit, or it could be a number of different bedrock units. And if you have a board or a hand dug well, that usually means there's no good aquifer in your area, and it's a large diameter well that's likely getting water from the water table that infiltrates near the surface. So the way to find that out, one is if you have your log, you know what depth you're at, then you contact your geological survey or your Department of Natural Resources, DEQ, whatever the office is that houses well logs, or makes aquifer maps in your state, and um, or it could be the USGS state office in your state, um, those guys can help you. Give them a call. Uh, you, they, I mean, that's their job. That's what they want to do. They want people to be informed. And in most states, uh, your state geological survey or state water survey, which there's only a couple in the country, do have maps of where all the aquifers are. Uh, in some cases, there are smaller aquifers on top of bigger aquifers. We have an area that I've done a lot of work in where there's three aquifers, sand and gravel aquifers, stacked on top of each other with clay in between. So you have wells at either 60 feet or 120 feet or at 300 feet, and they're in three different aquifers. And so you need to know the depth, and you need to have the area that's mapped, and their professionals should be able to help you. And that's uh, the bottom line. Again, they're glad to help you. Uh, I know we get calls from well owners all the time. And uh, that's, you know, that's what we, um, I won't say that's what we live for, but that's what we uh, like to do is help people out. So protection from surface contaminants. So this is kind of an open-ended question. What's considered protected or the best way to prevent surface contamination? Um, I, I believe the person mentioned is grouted better or uh, concrete casing or concrete 
top, really having a properly constructed well, if your state has well construction codes, um, will protect it from the surface. That's the idea. And we've come a long way over the last 30 or 40 years in developing those rules so that wells are safe from surface influences. The biggest risk is if you have an older well, as I said in the third bullet at the bottom there, if your well's in a pit, if it's a poor construction or it's a shallow uh, hand dug well or a board well that's getting water from the water table or an older well that doesn't meet construction codes, those generally all mean that you have more risk. And so um, also it's about understanding your water source. I mentioned those three aquifers, one's at 60 feet, one's at 120, and one's at 300. Obviously the ones that, that's at 300 feet uh, water ha from the surface has to go through two other aquifers and two other clay units to get down to it. Those fine grain materials like clay, silt, and shale that minimize flow uh, vertically down uh, protect your well and protect your water source. So if you're in an area that's maybe a lowland along a major river valley, you might have sand from the surface on down uh, to wherever your well is screened. That's more risky because there's surface infiltration that can get right into the aquifer, and we typically see that. We've done a lot of work here looking at depth of aquifer and surface soil infiltration capacity to look at the number of the percentage of wells that are contaminated with either nitrate or pesticides. We did this work 15 or 20 years ago, and it certainly does follow that depth of aquifer. If your aquifer is deeper and protected by um, materials like clay and silt, it's less likely to have surface contamination versus those that are closest to the surface, or if uh, there's no protective layer that'll, you know, retard that flow. How do wells work? The wells work differently depending on what type of well you have. A bedrock well works a little differently than a sand and gravel well. This is a chance for us to plug. We put together about 20 videos that are three to five minutes long on, you know, what's an artesian aquifer is one of them, and what's a sand and gravel well? How does my private water system work? If you go to privatewellclass.org and click on videos, you can find um, each of those and look through them. There's about, uh, I think there's 17 up right now, and they're, in the end there'll be about 30, 35. They're worth taking a look at, and they explain a lot of these basic concepts about wells that you need to know to understand if you know what type of well you have. Our webinars, like this one tonight, are also all recorded and put up on that website. So if you want to go back and look at a webinar on a different topic that we did, you know, six months ago, um, I know there was one last July that was really popular on septic systems. They're available. Just sit down and watch it on YouTube, on your computer. So we had a question about power outage. So during a prolonged power outage for months, you know, I grew up in a very rural area. We would have one time we went without power for a week. It was an ice storm. Um, I can't imagine how you'd be without power for months but what's the best way to get water from a well? And they mentioned a flow jack pump, which I am not familiar with. I did look it up, but like I said, growing up in a remote area myself, we had a backup, we had a generator that we could hook up to our power pole and would run. If you're in an area that doesn't have power, you're not only losing your well, uh, your pump, but you're losing your furnace, you're losing your freezer, your everything. So if you're going to live in a uh, situation like that for months, uh, the best thing to do is to have a generator. And they're pretty common today in rural areas, and that would certainly be my suggestion. Again, I'm not familiar with the flow jack pump, but I know there's a resurgence of hand pumps on wells for when the power is out. Some states allow those, some states don't. And um, I know you're on your own there. I would instead recommend something that's a, a solution for your home, not just for your well. But, um, yeah, that's my, my take on all that. So our well was installed in 2007. We bought the house in 2010. The contractor's retired. How do we find out the depth of our well? We're in the subdivision. Our neighbors uh, is 180 feet deep. Well, typically, if the same contractor built the homes, all the homes are put in all the wells, they're probably very similar in depth, and that's really common. So it wouldn't be a bad guess that your well's probably 180 feet deep if, you know, the land surface is fairly flat in that area. But it really depends on your state as far as what might be available. If you were in Illinois, um, which I said here at the end, give us a call. I guarantee you if your well was drilled in 2007, we've got the log here, and um, we can get you that information. But if you're in some states, like Pennsylvania or Alaska, they don't have well construction, the same kind of well construction codes or license 
requirements for contractors, and so the, some of that information is not available. Other states like New York, they didn't require drillers to file logs until 2001, I think. So if your well's older than that, it's not going to be there and available. The one thing I will say is many states now, especially because of CDC, has had a push to try to get more information out about private wells, where they're at, uh, water quality data related to them, and those sorts of things, because they're really valuable information. If you have a lot of water quality data about an aquifer, you see a lot more sites now, and Illinois has one too through our state geological survey, where you can pull up a map, it shows you every well, you can click on it, it'll show you the log right online. And so um, for m many states, I know um, I just talked to a guy in Louisiana that is in the process of building one of those sites, Wisconsin and Washington State, Illinois, a number of others have those. New York has one too. And so um, do some digging, talk to your state agency that regulates drillers or maintains well logs, and um, they may have those records. I know in California, the county health departments manage those logs, same way in Illinois. You file a, when a driller files a log, he files it with the county. They keep a copy. They mail a copy to us, and we have one large room that has you know, 500,000 well logs uh, in it. So and we scan those, and they're all available online. So that's the answer. If you have a specific problem finding a well log and you're interested, we would be glad to help you try to find it. So the thing to do there is go on our website. Our um, email address is info at privatewellclass.org. Give us a little more information where you're at, that sort of thing, and um, we can see if we can help you. So, okay. And, Dan, are you able to um, – I'm going to make sure I don't have you muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, I'm available, okay. yep. Okay, great. So livestock near my wells. Someone wrote in and said, you know, my well is too close to a livestock pen. There aren't animals there anymore, but my water still tests positive for bacteria and E. coli. What can I do? Well, there's a number of issues here. We need a little more information. One, how deep's the well? When was the well drilled? How long ago were livestock there? Without a source, you know, E. coli really don't survive that long. Um, they do for a while, but it really could be that there's a different source like your septic system. That would be my concern. You know, if livestock haven't been there for five years, I really doubt that's what's causing the E. coli problem in your well. And it could be that there's a breach at the surface or if it's an older well. But um, I guess regardless, we run into situations, and I mentioned this probably on every webinar it comes up. I was in New York last summer, and there's a shallow bedrock aquifer where the aquifer is like less than two feet from land surface. And yet there's a lot of homes in this one area where it's fairly populated, where everyone has their own septic system and drain field. So in a bedrock aquifer, all the water is running through the fractures. And so those septic systems are basically putting water full of E. coli into the aquifer directly, and it travels through the fractures, and it's cross-contaminating all these wells. So the only thing to do in that situation is to add continuous chlorination or UV disinfection so that you're running your water system like a community would. You're taking out all the bacteria, and you're having chlorinated water if you use chlorine. And I said continuous disinfection, I meant continuous chlorine disinfection. Or using ultraviolet light, which I know in some places where there's a lot of springs, those have a lot of bacteria as well. And there is a UV market for private wells and, and springs. And that's probably the best solution, is to just add a continuous chlorinator or UV to kill the bacteria if there, you can't figure out why you're still getting it. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned at the beginning, I've run into, and that's what I see in my head whenever this came up, an old dug well that was right in the middle of a feedlot with cattle all around it. You know, that's just there's no way it's not going to have E. coli and, and bacteria problems. But if there aren't livestock there anymore, the E. coli aren't going to be around there forever. So, yeah. If I shouldn't add chlorine bleach to my well each spring, how do we sanitize our well? Well, a lot of people believe that you can just dump a half a gallon of Clorox in your well each spring and you're taking care of things. That's actually a really bad idea. Chlorine bleach is 5%. It's too concentrated. It can affect rubber seals and a lot of other parts in your system, especially if you have you know, a pitless adapter. What we recommend is there is no schedule for disinfecting your well. If your well is properly sealed and it's properly constructed and there's no place for things to get in your well, then it shouldn't need disinfected uh, at all, any year. 
And if you do have a problem, the way you determine whether or not you need to add or do chlorination is by sampling. And you know, bacteria test is typically $15 to $25, and it's just not, it's not the best solution. It'll, it'll decrease the life of your system, uh, especially your pump and its components. So there's a very useful guide that we recommend. I didn't put the URL up here, but if you go on our website, for each of the class lessons, we list about um, 8 to 15 uh, resources that are all free, are publicly available, and, uh, and under Lesson 10, under Water Treatment Solutions, in our class resources, I think the fifth bullet or so is the Disinfection Guide from the Minnesota Department of Health. And if you follow their guidelines on disinfection, if you're going to disinfect, you know, they walk through why you should dilute the bleach to a certain PPM. I think it's between 50 and 200, maybe something like that, so that it's not quite as strong but it still does the job depending on how deep your well is and how big around your casing is. It tells you how much you need to apply. And, um, you know, then uh, what's really important is that you run that water through every faucet in your home until you smell chlorine. And then you shut it off and you leave it overnight. That's what kills the bacteria. And if you forget one faucet, that might be where there's some bacteria still there. It's eventually going to cause another problem. And so it's really important to make sure your entire system has been disinfected. Along with that, when one sanitizes their well with bleach, should you bypass the softener? My take on that is no, just because, and I, but I'm not a treatment person. Dan is. We'll let Dan pipe in here in a minute. But to properly disinfect your well and your water system, it means the entire system needs to be chlorinated to kill any type of bacteria that might be in. It could be in your shower head. It could be, you know, in one of your toilets. You flush everything and you run everything until you smell chlorine so that you know that every pipe has got treated water in it and it'll kill the bacteria. As far as your treatment uh, devices, like uh, your softener, every, you know, the Water Quality Association kind of guides how well things work. They, they're the rep for a lot of these manufacturers that make treatment devices. Every one of these has recommendations on the manufacturer's website for cleaning and disinfecting their devices, and you should look that stuff up to be sure how they recommend you, you do that. But, um, and, and Dan mentioned to me today that chlorine certainly can affect the resin, or that's what it, uh, his reading has, has shown him, but uh, my take is you want to make sure there's no bacteria in the system anywhere first. Uh, anything to add? Yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, I, I agree with Steve here. You should mostly chlorinate your uh, softener too. I I guess I read some things just to be sympathetic with the water treatment dealers who do say it, it's a bad thing. There are resources out there that say too much chlorine can uh, slowly deteriorate the resin, but uh, keep in mind that um, people on municipal supplies have a small, uh, like a couple parts per million of chlorine all the time, and softeners are designed to work with, with municipal systems, obviously. So uh, I think the big, my take on the big or more potential problematic uh, scenario is where you add a lot of bleach, you know, more than a couple parts per million, anywhere from maybe over 10 to a couple hundred. I've seen people talk about shock chlorination. So I think that's the biggest thing they're talking about when they say the chlorine can, can damage your resin. Uh, but I, I would, my take on it is, my take on the chlorination is that you have to add it to chlorinate your whole system, including your softener. Yeah, because I know we've um, talked before about, someone asked about whether RO would make a good good treatment <laughs> for bacteria. Well, the, the cartridge for an RO system can become a good place to harbor all those bacteria. And so, you know, everything does need to be disinfected, and they can grow in that media. And so um, it's actually a bad thing to use in most cases. Even though they would take bacteria out, they also could uh, create allow them to grow and all that stuff. So, all right. Thanks. Well maintenance. So what constitutes normal well maintenance? Uh, you know, I put some of those things in the talk today, tonight, but we do have a short video that's called Nine Best Management Practices for Private Wells, and it talks about, you know, just like annual well tests, um, you should test for coliform bacteria, nitrate, and any local contaminants of concern. I recommend you go through this. This is a six-minute video, it looks like. We, like I said, we put a whole bunch of these together, and we're making more of them. 
and it, it's actually in response to folks that have taken our class. We've had about uh, 4,500 people go through the private well class lessons, which are emailed to you once a week, um, all that stuff. And one of the biggest things we get is in the evaluation is people saying they don't like to read. They'd rather watch a video. And uh, I'm old-fashioned. That makes me sad, to be honest. But um, we're trying to uh, cater to that as well. And so that, you know, because our goal is to reach as many people as possible and help them understand what their responsibilities are. And so we are developing a lot of these short videos that are on our website on YouTube that provide you that information. So I certainly recommend you take a look. Uh, well water and blood levels of iron. There's actually two questions here, and I didn't highlight the second one in the title. Someone said they have high iron levels and liver enzymes. Is it the water? Basically, someone recommended that it could be the water, and um, they said they eat healthy and have a filter on their system. And I'll let Dan talk about the filter part of this, but we both agree it's worth testing your water for metals to see how high your iron or other things might be. But really, this is a question for a health department and a health professional. Dan's a chemist. I'm a groundwater hydrologist. It's really not our place. Um, I would refer this to someone I know who's in the medical field uh, to get their advice. But uh, getting your water tested so you know what's in the water, it also depends on how much you drink. You know, some things people think it could be the water, and it turns out you need to drink about uh, 300 gallons a day for it to really have an effect on you. And so it's worth knowing what's in your water for sure. Um, but it's also worth talking to a health professional to find out if what you're ingesting is even close to what it might be for some other things, like, you know, what you eat in your food or that sort of thing. Anything to add, Dan? No, good, good answer, Steve. Okay. And is it common for well owners to filter their water? And I actually took this from something Dan told me. Um, yes and no. Sometimes it's really necessary. You can have a lot of turbidity in your water, or you might be in a, a well that's in bedrock where, it's pulling up fines all the time, and if you don't, um, or you might have a breach in your, uh, if you have a sand and gravel well, you could have a small breach in your screen, and so some fine sand's coming through, and if you don't filter it, you're going to be scouring a lot of your pipes and fixtures and all those sorts of things, and so sometimes it's necessary, but it's also um, can be personal preference, and do you want to speak to that, Dan? Yeah, sure, a little bit. We get a lot of people calling to the lab, and they have problems with sediment. And uh, some some of them, the sediment's getting past some other filter. But uh, a lot of times, they don't have a physical filter in it. And I would say it's really a good idea. To, you're not going to. It's not going to be a pleasant thing to have the sediment coming through uh, your water. But also, it'll protect your softener or any other treatment from uh, clogging up. As some people as regarding softeners. Some people. I would say a lot of people are on softeners. Also, softeners should take out at least some amount of iron, look at the ratings of the softeners. Um, and, and iron is probably the, one of the most common questions we get in our lab. The water's brown. So I would put on a sediment filter to get out any iron that's already been oxidized and precipitated, but also a softener. Uh, but then there are also some people who say they don't want to drink softened water because of the elevated sodium levels or, or potassium, but typically sodium. So it is a, is a personal choice. Tough, softened water typically does, most people think it feels nicer, but um, that, that, like I say, that's a personal choice. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So how do I do scale and rest? Chuck actually answered this question and sent me a response, and I added it in here. So, you know, he suggested you use a softener to reduce scale and a physical filter for a rust, and possibly if you have iron-reducing bacteria, if you have a lot of iron, then you might want to chlorinate as well to, to get rid of those. It could just be, like Dan said, you're having iron because it's uh, oxidizing when it gets up out of the well and it might not be bacteria at all but um, yeah so as far as how to get rid of methane from well water you know we have several areas here where there's buried soils and some of the glacial deposits in Illinois and um, one of the areas I've worked in a lot a lot of the wells actually had a tap on the top of the well and a continual flame and that's just what they did for a long time. Uh, there's so much methane that's coming out of the uh, solution. And that happens because the weight of the ground compresses the water that's in the aquifers that are buried. And it keeps the methane in solution. And as soon as you pull that water up, you're reducing the pressure on the water and the methane bubbles out. So uh, another typical solution is that you would have, uh, you use aeration 
which is you know it's what it's doing. You give it a chance to air out, so to speak, lower the pressure so the methane can come out of the solution in the water. And the way you would handle that is you add an aeration tank in front of your pressure tank, and it would have a vent so that uh, the water goes into the aeration tank first without any pressure, and then you have a pump between a small pump between your aeration tank and your pressure tank that you apply the pressure to uh, give you your water pressure in your pressure tank for your system. So it is common, especially in glaciated areas, to have uh, methane, and uh, that's one of the typical ways it's handled. I don't have any experience with using an aeration tank in a home, but I, you know, I've been told that by several contractors. So um, I'd talk to your contractor if you're in an area where methane's common. Either they've done it or they know someone who has, and uh, that's probably what you need to do. Okay, so quickly, that's the questions we have for tonight. It's already 10 after 9. I want to mention, I've mentioned it several times, I guess, but on privatewellclass.org, there's a place on the lower left side where it says email class. If you click on that and sign up, it mails you one lesson a week for 10 weeks. It starts out describing geology and how water flows in the ground and how it gets in your well, and it goes all the way through common problems like why is my pump kicking on and off every five minutes? It's probably because of your the bladder in your pressure tank, or there could be a couple other problems. So it, common problems, what to do in emergency situations. Uh, there's one lesson that's just devoted to how to find local information. In the end, you know, we're in one place in the United States, and we're trying to help people from all over the country. And really what our goal is is to create uh, a more informed well owner so that you know how to ask the right questions and who to go to in your area. They can be much more help. Someone at the State Geological Survey in Kansas knows a lot more about Kansas groundwater than I do. And so our goal is to put that information in your hands so that you know who to contact in Kansas, as an example, and uh, they can help you with your questions. So if you haven't been to our website, I imagine you have if you've uh, signed up for this webinar, but I encourage you to look through all the information there. This is how you'd enroll in the class. All we ask for is your email address, your first name, and where you live. You click on the drop-down. It basically asks you for a state. And that's partly because we're funded by US EPA, and one of the things that we have to show uh, when we ask for funding from them is that this is actually truly a national program, and we're providing help to well owners from all over the country. So, yeah, you get one lesson every seven days, and uh, it's pretty simple. It mails you a PDF, and then you're on your own. It's you know, self-paced. There's a pre-test. There's a post-test. There's an evaluation. Uh, we certainly look at all the evaluations. And, again, that's where the videos came from. We've actually started podcasts and things like that as well uh, because people are interested in, in some of that new technology. This is the front page. You know, learn by email. Click on that at the bottom. And there's a lot of other resources as you go through here. Soon there will be this FAQ page I mentioned. And, yeah, it's all free. That's the, the great part of all this. Earlier I mentioned Lesson 10. There's a bunch of resources, and I think the fifth bullet has the disinfection guide from Minnesota. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the first two lessons and some of the materials that are here. These are resources we use to help write the lessons and also use some of the figures from these things. There's a lot of good resources all over the country. We try to use as many of those as we can from different parts of the country. So this isn't Illinois-centric. It's national-centric. And it also gives you a lot of other material. I wrote the lessons for the private well class. I wrote it like I'm talking to people. Some people don't like that style. There's a lot of other styles and some of these other documents that you can look through and maybe it makes more sense to you that way. And that's the idea. Some of the concepts related to groundwater and water flow and contamination aren't straightforward and, and the way I've explained them might not have been the best way for some people. And so hopefully if you look through some of these extra resources, which are all free, you might understand it better. And that's the goal. Yeah, so I guess here's our goal for everyone who's involved with this that has a well. It's so that you understand why your well is important, not only to you, but to your neighbors and to the aquifer and, and the groundwater, but why you need to understand how it works and how that helps you prevent contamination and protects your family from risk. So it is important stuff. You're the steward of a well. Again, you're the, you're the operator of a very small water system, and uh, it's important that you understand what that means. And I guess the last thing here. If you have a well log and you understand it, you're way ahead of the game. You understand where your water is coming from, if you have a screen or not, you know, where your pump's set. We get a lot of situations where someone thinks their well's gone dry and it turns out that their pump was only set at 50 feet even though they have a 100-foot well. 
and they can lower their pump at 25 feet, still have plenty of water in their well and never have a problem. And it's understanding some of those things and, you know, what the water level is in your well and all those things. So that the third and the fourth bullet are the most important here. We hope that by going through our class and these webinars and the videos and everything else, that it helps you learn to ask the right questions and understand what your local sources of information are. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are working with private well owners in their own local area, and uh, most of us don't have a chance to share our information with others. And, um, you know, there's, there's some pretty knowledgeable people out there. And, again, you should always sample your well annually. Um, some people think that's overkill or, you know, I know my well's safe. I've sampled it once. You know, things can change. And uh, groundwater is a resource, but it's not, you know, it's, it's a renewable resource. And the hydrologic cycle indicates that water that's in the air today eventually ends up in the ground. So it's not like it's just sitting there and it's always going to be pristine. Um, it's always moving all the time. So um, we're going to take a break. I'm going to drop this slide presentation and pull up a Google Doc that uh, Katie's been working on with all your questions. And uh, Katie, are you ready? Let's see if this works. Oh, yep, I think it's all ready to go. Okay, so here's the questions we have. Let's, uh, we have a few here. Good deal. Okay, so I have a well that's not been used for 30 years. I would like to use it. How would I go about this? Well, the problem with that isn't just the well, but also the pipes. If they haven't been full, if it hasn't been pressurized, there's likely rust or bacteria or all kinds of things. You know, you can certainly, the, the well itself may be fine. You know, there's many wells that are still in use that are 100 years old. Uh, if they were done properly and they were sealed properly or they've been, you know, modified over time so that now they meet code or they're actually, you know, still working properly, 30 years doesn't mean your well isn't any good, for sure. But it's the rest of the system that I would be concerned about if it's still connected to, you know, the old piping system and all those things. Um, it certainly all have to be disinfected, put under pressure. You know, I wouldn't even be surprised if some of the pipes leak, that sort of thing. And I guess it comes down to, you know, is this an old house or is it just the well? It probably needs a new pump, obviously. Um, I would, you know, first thing, bring in a contractor to evaluate that. But it, uh, yeah, I mean, it could go from, man, this works great, I don't have any problems, to... You know, there's a lot of iron here, and there's 30 years of oxidation that if uh, the screen, you can, you know, there's there's 12 feet of oxidized iron in the well, at the bottom of the well, and there's only a six-foot screen. The whole thing would have to be blown out or, uh, uh, what's the right term? I can't even think of it. Rehabilitated, anyway. So it really depends, but at first I would I would have a contractor look at it, and they would have the best advice. Yeah. My pipe is in my front yard. I put down fertilizer and weed preventer. Will this hurt my well? I guess, are you talking about the pipe that runs from your well to your house? And if so, that should all be sealed. You know, there should be no, in theory, you could pour things right over your pipe, your, the pipe that runs from your well to your house, and it's not going to go through the pipe. And so... You know, it's certainly if you have a shallower well, it's best not to put fertilizer or ag chemicals or pesticides near your well because they will leach into the ground, and depending on what they are, how persistent they are. But, you know, the example I mentioned before, if you have a sand and gravel well and it's 100 feet deep and the screen's from 95 to 100, then the only place water is going in that well is from 95 to 100 feet. So the fact that you're applying fertilizer at the surface, as long as the well is properly sealed and the annulus has grout and it meets code so that water's not running down the annulus outside of the well to get down near the screen, you likely wouldn't see any issue. I guess, yeah, if you want to email me, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by pipe, but if it's the pipe that runs from your home to the well, you know, that's all sealed. It's under pressure. So there's no way that something's going to get into the system that way. Um, we're planning to have a well put on our property that will go into the Hayes Aquifer. Okay, so um, there's an oil drilling company that surveyed the land within 1,500 feet of our property. 
is it a good idea to have a well dug for quality drinking water? I don't know where the Hayes Aquifer is, but I the fact that they've that there might be oil, you know, the oil could be at seven thousand feet, and the Hayes Aquifer could be a sand and gravel aquifer that's at two hundred, and in that case, there should be no problem. Depending on the laws in your state, the oil company has a responsibility to protect all the shallow uh, aquifers and anything that's water bearing. So, you know, they may put in 2,000 feet of casing to case off their oil well, and so there's no, uh, as long as the casing doesn't leak or it's not sealed properly, then there would be no connection. I know Southern Illinois has a lot of oil wells that go through sand and gravel aquifers down into the rock where there's uh, oil at, say, three or 4,000 feet, and, um, you know, the well's there or uh, there, there's never been an issue um, or very seldom, uh, it would be uh, a human error from the oil company if you had a problem uh, because they have to be cognizant of that when they get a permit to put in an oil well and all those sorts of things. So it's not a, you know, is it a good idea? You know, I, I certainly don't think it's necessarily a bad idea to go ahead and put a well in. Yeah, and again, I don't know anything about the Hayes Aquifer or what state that's in. But, um, you know, talk to your state geological survey or maybe even your state extension office at whatever university they might be. And uh, depending on how active they are, I know like in Pennsylvania where there's a lot of fracking, the extension folks there um, are heavily involved with private well owners and uh, even do workshops to help them out and all that sort of stuff. And they are very up on the, you know, the fracking game and the risk to the shallow, to the aquifers there and water quality changes and all that stuff. So look for someone at a state agency uh, who can help. Um, and if you email me more about your situation, I've got a lot of contacts. I'm glad to call folks in other states and even help find out. Uh, it, it, you know, it helps me to understand uh, as well. So, and I'm glad to do it. Since there are so many variables, is there somewhere we can list our specific variables to get suggestions for what to test for? Well, if you send me, like, again, send me an email. I had a guy in California call me about sampling as well, and at the time, California hadn't opened up their well logs to, uh, you had to be the well owner to get a well log. And so I'm trying to help this guy, and the county won't even give me the log. He had to go get the log, fax it to me, and then we went from there. And so... You know, that's part of our role here is to be a resource for you guys, our well owners. And so I can do one of two things. I can either give you some suggestions or to find out somebody in your area who you could talk to. So that's what I suggest. Yeah, and if you send me a list of all the variables that are in your situation, you know, I'm not going to know if there's arsenic in, the, in your local aquifer, but there's, I know how to find that out. That's the bottom line. So or one of my staff. Is there any research being done to work on pre-warning for potential drastic changes in your water, uh, like seismic activity or someone within five miles deciding to frack? There is no such thing that I know of. You know, I'm, I have two monitoring well networks in the state of Illinois that I manage since the 90s. And every 10 years or so, we might take a water quality sample, but they're really to look at water levels. And like when the fault in Missouri uh, moved last year, two years ago, some of our wells actually showed blips from that. But as far as understanding drastic changes, um, a pre-warning system, you know, I think the way we look at things, and we actually have a video about emergency situations, like if there's a fire or some kind of drastic thing, if, if there's a real earthquake and you're in an area where that could happen, then I would test your water before I drank it after that happened. Because especially if it's a very deep well, you have things, when those faults are moving, different aquifers and different bedrock aquifers have different water qualities and so it could be that some of those can intermix where they couldn't before. I know um, in Wisconsin for instance there's an aquifer in the bedrock that's you know I don't know how deep let's say 750 feet below land surface that has arsenic at 3,000 ppb so the state has legislated that you cannot put a well in that aquifer. You can go above it or you can go below it but if you go below it, which there's freshwater aquifers below it that have low arsenic, you have to case all the way through that unit. So down to 1,000 feet or so with casing 
so that you make sure that no water from that unit that's got 3,000 ppb of arsenic can get into your well. So, you know, when you have a unit that's so high in arsenic, if there were a large earthquake and new fractures opened up or new connections between units, you know, that could change the water quality significantly. You know, in that case, I would say, you know, if you're near an area where there was a major earthquake, I would certainly test my water before using it again, especially if it's a deep well or if it's a bedrock well. As far as fracking, you know, fracking's not new. I'm, I'm, I've stayed out of the whole fracking argument on both sides just because in some areas where they frack, there aren't any good gra groundwaters for water supply. And others there really are, and they need to be a lot more careful. But everything that's happened, like in Ohio where they've had problems or in Texas, it always ends up being a um, man-made problem not because fracking has contaminated a whole aquifer and that sort of thing. And it's just like anything else. People like to make money, and so people sometimes cut corners or don't do what they're supposed to do. And, you know, that could happen whether it's fracking or some other activity. You know, why do we find barrels buried along uh, some sand and gravel areas in an old dead-end road? Because people don't want to take it to a landfill and do what they're supposed to do they dump it because it's uh, they uh, have no scruples or morals and don't care um, what they contaminate. So fracking is just the newest of one of those type of things in my book. And, um, you know, it all comes down to being a good steward and all those things. So that's not an answer to your question. But as far as a chemical monitor or warning system, those things don't exist that I know of. Some of the technology is getting there. I know there's community water supplies that have SCADA systems, which are electronic monitoring for all their water, uh, that do show them changes in water chemistry. But as far as, you know, really being developed as a security system or a warning system, I don't think it exists. So um, it's a great idea. Hopefully someday we'll get there. All right. That's the last question we have. Katie, anything else? Um, that, that's all that we have for tonight, I believe. Okay. Well, for those of you that are still here, I appreciate it. Again, feel free to email us at info at privatewellclass.org if you have any questions and or you want to follow up. I get those emails along with a couple other people. And if you dial the phone number that's on there, that also either I'll pick it up or one of my staff, and we will get back to you. We answer all of those. Yeah. So I guess that's it for tonight. Thanks for attending, and uh, good luck with your wells. And again, I uh, hope you enjoy the information we provide. Please give us feedback if there's things that you would like to see that we don't provide on our website, or if you have other ideas for things we can provide. So um, that's our goal. All right, take care.